Hi, this is Mika Häkkinen, and you are listening to Pian to Create. Hi everyone, and welcome to Beyond the Grid, presented by the new Bose noise cancelling headphones 700. My name is Tom Clarkson, and my goodness, do we have a treat for you this week. My guest is one of the fastest and bravest men I've ever met. His commitment in a racing car was stunning to watch, particularly on a qualifying lap. And he somehow came back from a horrifying accident at the end of 1995, not only to win races, but to win two world championships. I'm talking, of course, about the original flying fin, Mika Hakkinen. In short, Mick has been there and done it. He beat Ayrton Senna in the same car, ditto Nigel Mansell. He had some fantastic scraps with Michael Schumacher, a rivalry that began in the junior formulas way before they got to Formula One. And he found an inner strength after that Adelaide crash that very few people in the world possess. Mick is an inspirational figure, and he retired at the end of 2001 with the respect of the Formula One paddock. Respect for his speed, respect for the manner in which he went racing, respect for his bravery and respect for his decency as a human being. We sat down in Monaco recently and the result was Mika as I'd never heard him before. He was relaxed, thoughtful and very insightful. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Mika, moi. Oh yes, that's finished, definitely, yeah. <laughs> that is the extent of my finish. <laughs> <laughs> but Moy, welcome to Beyond the Grid. It's lovely to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Now, Mika, this year we're celebrating 20 years since your second world championship. So when you look back at that and when you look back at Formula One, how important was Formula One to you? Well, yes, exactly. 20 years ago, it, it, winning, winning a world championship is definitely... So it's it's a long time ago. Even uh, you know why it's why it's, it is a long time ago. But some reason it feels like yesterday because all these motions, what what I went through to able to achieve that victory, you know, it it it, it was so strong that you never forget it. You carry that every day in your life. That that memory uh, and and how important Formula One. Uh, was for me and you know uh, it, it was definitely an incredible uh, life school and what that means is yes motor racing is a great sport and uh, and it's great fun and and but when you do enter the Formula One it, it becoming same time uh, not only the your 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 sport your your fun what you do it's becoming your work and your attitude needs to be changed to to different level to to able to get the success. Otherwise, somebody takes your place. And and uh, it it's not anymore Formula One for me. You know, when I entered the Formula One, was was definitely oh wow, this is great, this is fantastic. I could have been Formula One. And and uh, yes, I I know I'm great talent. You know, and I can I can do well. But it really opened my eyes later on that way. This is, this is an incredible challenge to becoming good in different uh, aspects of Formula One. So it's not about just the turning a steering left or right. It is to do much more uh, than, than just having fun and driving a car. Can you remember the impression a Formula One car made on you the first time you drove one? I think it was the Benetton... You went straight out and you were faster than Alessandro Nanini, straight out of Formula 3. Yes, that, again, that, that was a great day. It was a great day in, in Silverstone. Uh, we, we have, I had a chance to do one day testing, which was incredible. Uh, and it, it was, you know, doing the seat fitting first of all. I recognize sitting in this, you know, my experience was Formula 3 before that. So sitting in this uh, Formula 1 car, I recognized, wow, this is so tiny. You know, the car was really tiny inside. And smaller than a Formula 3 car? Smaller than a Formula 3 car. Wow. And, and uh, I, I've recognized being it like, mm, this is not so pleasant. This is not so <laughs> comfortable to... Even, of course, Formula 1, you, you designed a special seat, you know, designed for your, your body. And, and, but even the driving position, you weren't able to do that how you wanted to do. It was something that, you know, it was so tiny. 
but that day, you know, when I, when I, when the team did start the engine and, and I went to the racetrack, the gearbox was six speed gearbox, manual gearbox. There was no power steering, more like a F3 car. I think F3, we have five, five speed or something. And I did recognize, you know, going to, 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 to the racetrack, you know, to even to turning the steering in Formula One, it was very responsive. You know, the car was really, really responsive. Car was very stiff. It felt, it felt great. Uh, and How then, hard was it to be quick? No, it was not very, it was not too difficult. But what was impressive was, of course, the power. You know, it didn't matter what gear you were in and you accelerating, just the torque was massive. And of course, when you put the six gear and you, you know, hang a straight and you put your foot down, you're thinking, holy shit. <laughs> You know, this, this is not going to stop. It just keeps accelerating, keeps accelerating. And in, in that time, you know, and the hangar straight in Silverstone, you had a corner called Stowe. And uh, I think it's still it called Stowe. Yeah. Still do, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's it, changed the profile of the it corner. It changed the profile. Yeah. So at that time, the corner was nearly flat. So you just had a lift and, and you're going in. And, and when, you, when you're heading there to 300 kilometers per hour, it, it was a, it was a, incredible feeling to experience the grip of the tires downforce what the car had so so i felt made it like okay i can i can push i can come on a limit the car doesn't slide on the front it doesn't slide on the rear i can just go faster and faster and uh, it was not too difficult to go fast is and that a reflection on your talent or on the car being quite easy to drive or both it was a combination, it was both. The car had a one uh, uh, balance problem and it was not happening in the high speed. The high speed, the car was really good. It was really beautiful, really fast. And, and, uh, and it was just, uh, it was happening in the low speed corners that the car had a really, really bad snap oversteer. Mika, I'm amazed. Snap oversteer, I don't know. It's, a, it's a quite a technical one. No, no, maybe. we can do oversteer on this but show. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was a little a bit really, of oppo. We love it that. It was really, really nice. You know, you're putting car on a limit under braking in a high speed, but in a, in a low speed, medium speed corners, you, you brake really hard. You're coming down the gear. You turn in. Everything looks fine. And saddle to middle of the corner, back end just went. You couldn't do nothing. And that was a really uh, difficult to... Uh, I'm amazed. To, to, to even you have a even you have a talent driver driving it to catch that kind of problem, it was nearly impossible. So there was something, of course, of course, it never problem with the driver. So it was a it was some kind of it was some kind of aerodynamic or mechanical or the weight. And had the regular drivers been complaining? Oh about yeah, that? absolutely. Now but, I'm going to tell you why I'm amazed because yeah. I keep saying this, but I am amazed that you can remember this day with such clarity. It was one day. I know. A long well, time ago. <laughs> I, it's a long time ago. But, but to be honest, it's, it's like, a, I'll give you an example that if you were to, if you were to do a 25 years ago, first time a bunch jump, you would remember that. You know, you would remember who would rope around your ankles and, and where you would be, which country, which location. And you remember when you jumped down, you could think you're going to die. That's the same thing. Formula One is so fast that when you, when you lose the control, the first thing in your mind comes, this is it. Mm. The life is over. Mm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> luckily, of course, in Formula One tracks, you have safety areas and this and that. So it's a different thing. But again, this shock, what you're getting in your, your memory, you never forget. So sort of see it on, on your brain. But yeah. Now, right at the top, we talked about that second world championship. And I just wanted to ask you, how satisfying was it to win the title for a second time? Because there have been a lot of one-hit wonders in Formula One, but you need real class to win two on the trot. How important was it for you personally to win that second one? It, it was definitely important. And of course I am, but uh, it, it was really important. Uh, we had a good car. So to winning a second world championship, there's no excuses. You know, we, we were quick. Only who was challenged, of course, was my teammate was, you know, giving me a hard time. We had technical issues, driving errors, but it was really important because I knew also it was important for the team, you know, to get maximum result. And like I said, we had a good car. There's no way we can come out 
in this year, 99, when I won the world, second world championship, not winning it. We had the best car. Do you, you think know. you're... <laughs> but Mika, I don't want to go there to be second, you know. <laughs> but do you think, was your advantage bigger or less than it had been in 98? Well, 98, we, we did had a, we had a mega car. We had a really amazing car. And, and the car, okay, car had some little balance issues, but, and, and little drivability issues, but they are the things what we were working on and they weren't dramatic, you know, they were something we can live with it. But 99, uh, the regulations did change a little bit and the team same time, they were really, really uh, developing a car in a higher level, taking some risks, materials, it's a matter of calculation, you know, that because the teams want to make the car light as possible. So the materials get in thinner and it, it brings certain risks. So the 99 uh, car was really, it was a dif more difficult to drive, so. Why was it more difficult to drive? It, it was difficult to drive because the regulation changes. We, have, we had these tires, you know, we were using Bridgestone tires where we have these crew, Grooves, grooves, yeah. grooves in a, oh, in we a, all loved them, didn't we? Yeah, grooves <laughs> in the tires that way because the Formula One's car was so quick, they want to reduce the speed limit a uh, little bit. So that was like a quick solution. Uh, so in in ninety eight we had three of those, and ninety nine we have four of those. The team uh, certainly did analyze that what is going to do for the balance, but I think there was too many parameters which were affecting the performance of the car. So it, it becoming, the car came definitely much more, let's call it nervous from the rear end. Racing drivers don't want that. It's okay, you have a good front end. It's, it's, it's nice to have that. But if you have same time the rear end, which is not there, it, it's unpleasant. It takes your confidence away. Because we did see in 99, a couple actually of uncharacteristic mistakes from you. I think it was crashing from out of the lead at Imola. Mm -hmm. And again, at Monza, Ferrari territory. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Funny enough. Yeah. I mean, um, is that what we're talking about here? The nervousness of the rear of the car? Is that what caused those accidents? I, I think those two accidents, actually, to be honest, they weren't uh, uh, caused because of that. I think the, the, what these two races has common, yes, both of them, they were in Italy. But was that a factor, sort of just all the Ferrari noise, Tifosi? No, no. But, but the, what, is, what is too common with these two accidents were both of these accidents happened when you had three stop tactic in a race. And uh, it, it was a calculation that we really need to create a certain lap time compared to our competitors to able to finish first. So that means every lap time has to be a certain window, not two tenths lower, you know, it has to be spot on all the time. And when you do that, when the driver has to perform fighting against the clock all the time, you need to take risks. Because what means that, you need to drive flat out. And when you drive flat out, you need to take risks. And when you take risks, you know, shit can happen. <laughs> and it did happen. It did. Oh so, and, and, and we did have a discussion in Imola. We had a discussion also in, in Monza. That way, this is going to be a difficult one. If we do this kind of decision, it's going to be really, really tough. Imola was purely my mistake. I was just, I, it was no doubt about it because I was just too greedy, pushing too hard on a curb and, you know, just going too, too fast. And Monza was, uh, I would say, 50 50 with the team. And that, that hurt a lot in Monza. That was really bad. Hurt, certainly from a championship point of view, didn't it? Because yeah. suddenly we then went to, what was it, Malaysia, and Schumacher comes back and starts yeah. being a bit of a thorn in your side. But last question about 99 is it all about that final race at Suzuka. Schumacher's on pole on the left-hand side. You're second on the inside, the dirty side of the track. Mm -hmm. You make, I think, perhaps the best start I've ever seen anyone make yeah. in Formula One, and you take the lead. And then you're gone. Championship's in the bag, job done. But that whole battle with Irvine and Schumacher, 
Do you believe that Michael Schumacher wanted Eddie Irvine to win that world championship in 99? Well, if I would have been in the same position like Michael was, I think uh, I think it would have been a great team to win. <laughs> But I don't think I would be too volunteer to, to do this kind of help. So answer your question, I, I don't think Michael wanted to Eddie to, to win. I don't think so. I don't, I don't think so because uh, he's been working hard with the team to develop the car and, and knowing Michael, he wanted to be the number one. So it would not look good if Eddie just takes the cold medal. But... It, Again, it's of course difficult to know 100%, but... Uh... Very interesting. If you haven't signed up to receive your special offer from our good friends at Harry's, then what are you waiting for? Get the best quality shave for half the price of other brands out there by making sure you go to harrys.com slash F1 podcast to get your hands on a trial set for just £3.95. There are 600 engineers, designers, craftsmen and chemists at the Harry's factory in Germany working hard and making products from only the finest materials and ingredients to ensure that you get the smoothest shave possible. And getting your hands on a trial set couldn't be easier to arrange. I know this because I've got one myself and it's a great piece of kit. Just enter your details online and you'll get a package delivered to your door with all you need to get going, including... A weighted ergonomic handle, ensuring maximum comfort and grip while you shave. Five precision engineered blades with a lubricating strip and a trimmer blade. You'll also get a foaming shave gel to keep your skin in top-notch condition and a handy little travel blade cover. Superb quality and you still get change from a fiver. So get started shaving with Harry's today by claiming your trial set for £3.95. Support our podcast and get your trial set delivered to you and it includes a razor handle, five blade cartridge, foaming shave gel and a travel blade cover by going to harrys.com slash F1 podcast right now. That's harrys.com slash F1 podcast. Right, let's get back to Mika. Now let's talk a little bit about Schumacher because he, he in a way over the duration of your career was, is it fair to say he was your biggest rival? Yeah, I, I would say so, yes. Yeah. And how important was it for you and your motivation to have a rival as good as him? It, it was a very motivating. It was very motivating, motivating indeed. Uh, you, you need competition, let's say it this way. Uh, was it, it more satisfying beating him than anyone else? Well, I, I would say yes, yes. But, uh, you know, what I did like to Michael to compete against him because he was a very consistent, very consistent to race against. Uh, even he was uh, quite a tough one, quite a, sometimes very aggressive to race against. But he was consistent. and uh, he, Consistently he, aggressive? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's the right. That's the exactly correct way. Yes, you kind of so, knew what you were getting into bed with every time you went wheel to wheel with him. Yeah, mm. I knew what was going on. But some drivers, one day they had this day, one day after that. So you never knew what what was happening. So it it was not uh, it was not pleasant racing. So with Michael, you knew what's going on, and 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 uh, yeah, the Michael Michael was the toughest and, and the most consistent. And I th I, I felt that. Uh, if we go back on big way on time, you know, we had a go karting career, me, Michael, Michael in Germany, me in Finland. Then move in different categories. Michael had a great career in Germany. I had a great career in England. Except I did one race in Germany in Formula 3 when, when Michael was fighting a championship. And I was, we went there just for, you know, we were guest team to race there and, and we did beat everybody in Germany. And I think it left a really bad feeling to Michael because Michael was a really rising star in Germany to be, you know, F3 winner. And, and then comes this team in England and shows everybody how the things should be done. You know, the team, of course, I drove West Side Racing with Dick Bennett and, and, and it was a great team. We had a great car. So the whole package was in great condition. So it made the look German F3 really not good at all. 
including the drivers. So I don't think the Michael was very happy. And we're moving on. The, of course, uh, the World Championship race, what we call it in F3, in Macau, when we had a, quite a great challenges together with Michael and me until we crashed in a, in a second heat. But Michael was able to continue and I stopped and Michael was the winner. So there's a little bit history on a background with disturbing our, not disturbing, but it was a thing what's going on in our mind a little bit when we entered the Formula One. So I did enter the Formula One a bit earlier than Michael did in a, in a team which was not, unfortunately, was not in a good form, you know, in terms of budget, in terms of the performance of the car. Of course, I was also learning a lot, no question about that. Michael arriving in, uh, in Formula One uh, one and a half years later when I did, but he went straight away with the team, which was already not so bad, fighting in top seven position. And with the Michael's performance, uh, they really jumped up and it just turned out to be really good. And of course, I think Michael did with the Team Jordan, maybe one or two races, and then Flavio Priatore took it for the Benetton. Okay, can I just stop you there? No. I, <laughs> we'll come were you, because your, your routes were different, so you both did Formula 3, you then go straight into Formula 1, and Michael is embedded in the Mercedes junior team, sports cars. Was there a little bit of you that was jealous of him, having that manufacturer backing behind him, or were you just totally focused on your own thing? No, I wasn't jealous. Uh, it's 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 a natural feeling uh, what the driver is experiencing that when you've been racing somebody against you know many many years in lower categories and suddenly you move example like in Formula One and then this guy is one and a half seconds quicker. I said no way. I you know there's no way. It just suddenly changes like this. So it's it's not easy to handle it. In Formula One, there is a reason why it happens. I was keeping my feet on the ground. I knew I was still, you know, coming from the very small population from Finland. Uh, the financial package, what we can bring from Finland, is not so powerful than when you come from Germany. All the marketing reasons why to have a German driver, it's better for the team than having a Mr. Nobody from Finland. <laughs> it's just gonna. You know, so it was a, there is a lot of many different aspects which are influencing the situation. So I was calculating my mind, this is it, you know, Mika, keep going and, you know, we'll get your right position and place. When How influential was Keke Rosberg in, at this point in your career? Oh, super important and very influential. And, and uh, Keke had his network, you know, and, and uh, you know, in, in Formula One world, <clears throat> you cannot just uh, you just cannot sit in a motorhome and work with the engineers. You had to go around. You had to see the people. You need to talk to people. And everybody, every driver is a different personality. They need, they have different needs. So that time Keke was very important, very good for me. Uh, keeping network, uh, contact with the people, analyzing what was happening at the market. So that was really important. So I got opportunity focused on my main work, to work with the team, with the engineers, and, and improving myself to be a better racing driver. And Keke did the, the talking and the... Absolutely. Could you have made it without him? Well, to be honest, no. No, no way. Well, I, I think there could be a possibility to, to enter the Formula One, one way or other, but I don't... You know, it's such a complicated puzzle that you had to calculate nonstop what is the next move and you cannot, you cannot live in that day. You really have to see really far what's going to happen, what the people are going to do and the whole, what, the whole Formula 1, what they're going to do. It's not just uh, thinking about to go to the next race. Mm. Now back to Schumacher. What do you think were his strengths and weaknesses as a driver? <laughs> <laughs> well, Michael had a very good technical uh, knowledge, uh, that's for sure. And, and I think that, that was a very important uh, element. Physically very fit, 
very fit driver indeed. And then one thing what he did have, but it's not maybe because of him, but you know, in, in those days when I was racing, when he was racing with Ferrari, they, they, they were testing in Fiorano. They, they didn't have a, what time the track is open in a track closing. You know, they were just there flat out as much as they want. The own track for Ferrari. And we had to go to Silverstone to testing with opens at 10, closes at 12, opens at 1, or was it whatever. That's really Finishing at 5. So you have actually, if you, have a, if you started your installation lap in the morning at 10 o'clock and then you had a, some kind of failure in the engine, it takes three hours to change everything. So you lost half a day. And you really felt at the time that that, oh my that God. gave them a massive advantage. Oh, massive. I yeah. mean, you know, if we would have run from 8 o'clock until 8 o'clock in the evening, I should remember, didn't Ron try and buy Lydon Hill, which yeah, is a little I, racetrack I, in the southeast of England? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It would For that reason, he wanted his own Fiorano. Oh, absolutely. Mm. It would have made a massive difference in the development uh, of the car itself, the drivers, uh, including mechanics, practicing the real for the tyre changes or refueling, whatever. You know, it would make a massive difference. I think it would have bring also the drivers, the, the team closer, you know, the, the mechanics closer, everything would have improved through that. So that was the one of the things what Michael had a big advantage. What about Michael's weaknesses? What did you pinpoint? Because I'm sure when you're racing against a guy, you, you, you have to weigh up in your mind, don't you, what their strengths and their weaknesses are. You've listed the strengths. Mm. What do you think were his weaknesses? Well, he did, he did not have too many weaknesses, to be honest. Uh, uh, but uh, how would I say... Is it quite a long pause now? I try to think the weaknesses. There was not too. Well, not, there was not too. There was not He won too, 91 Grand Prix, didn't he? And you know, I, I think Michael knew that he, he's quick and, and he, he knew what he was doing. But I think Michael knew at the same time, I'm fast and I know that. And I think Michael saw when he saw me that way, Mika thinks he's quicker than me. So it was a little bit psychological game there. But. I think uh, Michael showed a lot of confidence outside, but I don't think inside he, he confidence was lacking quite often. And uh, you, can, you can see that. Well, I, I saw that when it's happening and, and that was the time of attack. Anyway, I mean, I have an enormous respect of, of the way he was working on with the team and developing a car together and unable to achieve what they did. It was incredible. But he didn't do alone that, you know, he did he had a great team around him. But he I felt he has a lack of confidence, you know. Sure. But but difficult to say when you're on a driving on a racetrack, I think he did some desperate moves sometimes. I I, I felt, you know, when, when you're racing out there and you clearly you are slower than somebody else. You don't do this kind of maneuvers, you know, when you are really slower because it's, it's ridiculous. So I, I felt that was, that was something to do that way you don't... The season is long and there's a lot of races. So one race not going to end of the day is not going to change the whole world. Were you surprised by Adelaide 94 when he crash with Damon Hill or Hereth 97, the race that you went on to win actually, but when he crashed with Jacques, were you surprised by those maneuvers? No, not at all. No, it was the last race. It was a, a part of championship. So I, I understand that. I, I think easy to say I would do the same, but uh, I would not at <laughs> this level uh, I would not do that uh, in, in Formula 1. It, it, would, it would be definitely too obvious uh, to do something like You can play some tricks and try everything in this world, but you don't crash into somebody. I think that's, that's too much. Okay. I mean, you can do some naughty stuff out there on, on a, you know, do something which is not so, not so far in the rule book, you know, but crashing break, into break somebody. testing, that kind of thing. No, I would not even do that because that's dangerous. That's okay. basically crashing. What do you, what but, do you mean? What's 
Well, there is. What's your of, box of tricks? What well, you, you can always you can always do some tricks because some places you just simply cannot overtake. You know, so you can you can do you can do driving with only well seventy percent and just just tease the driver behind. That way they will lose their nerves. You know, like what Michael did for me in ninety nine in in Malaysia. I think he did. You know, so so you can you can do that quite easily. It doesn't. It's not shown on a television, but it's really nasty for for a racing driver to perform behind the driver like that. So Michael could have do that, and I, I, if I would have been in the same position, I would have do the same thing. But Damon, of course, was different because there are different positions in in a race. But uh, do you think you were quicker than him? Of course, of course. I mean, that's no, no. Of course, that's where you had to think about it. I think we had a little bit different driving technique i think we had a little bit different driving technique and that was i think that michael was technically very good in low speed and and i felt i was technically maybe a bit better in high speed but nevertheless it, it was okay you knew him for so long you mm-hmm. know you, as you as we've already discussed you you raced each other in the junior formulas then all the way through formula one did you have much of a relationship off track mm, i i we we did try to hang around uh, we, we try to be friends uh, but it just didn't work out <laughs> it didn't work out I tell you just because uh, the rivalry was too intense or, or the rivalry maybe too intense or something something was just didn't something didn't match you know <laughs> when you retired did that change anything well when I did retire Michael did continue racing uh, and uh, it, it really didn't change uh, it's really sad you know one cent uh, but it's okay there was a still certain respect in a certain respect that uh, we knew each other our abilities of motor racing and Michael was taking very seriously his 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 driving his work like it's normal and I have a different way of working and uh, I think that maybe didn't fit to his way of looking at things and, and vice versa. Because if you look at the Formula One, and even today is harder, you know, it, it's so many Grand Prix. You know, it's a tough environment. It's a month longer now, I guess, from when you were racing, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's really amazingly. Uh, it's, it's very impressive to see it, uh, the people to able to, to do this kind of challenge to, to travel around the world. And it's not only traveling around the world, but it's also doing performance physically at the Grand Prix to, to perform, you know, to have certain rules what you have to follow. One last thought on Michael, Spa 2000, you've talked about it a lot. Mm. Was that in some way a definitive moment in your relationship in that he did the dirty on you the lap before, tried to put you on the grass going up to Le Combe, you then get him the next lap. Was that in some way definitive in your mind? Was there, was there some unspoken message that that manoeuvre spoke to Michael somehow? Well, we, we, had, a, we had a little bit similar incident in, in the similar racing uh, situation in Macau 1990 when we were racing for Matri and, and I knew the, Michael's way of, of not able to, if you're behind the Michael, not you know, he has certain way of protecting his position and, and the spa, he was doing the same thing. So, so, uh, it's very, it's, it's in, it was an incredible situation. I mean, the racing, uh, when you go 300 kilometers per hour and you're really following somebody and you know you're much quicker and you're ready to overtake and front of somebody just pulls front of you and option is to go on a cross, you know, in 300 kilometers per hour. If you go 300 kilometers per hour in Formula One on a cross, you will crash for sure. I'm sure listeners and, and, and you know, you have experience when you're driving your road car and suddenly somebody pulls front of you and you go like, oh my God, what the person is doing, you know? So imagine a Formula One car in this situation when you go 300 kilometers per hour and somebody does that. It's something what you and what, what what I understand that way, it can happen 
accidentally. That's why you don't look at your mirrors. But when it happens, you know, three, four times and person knows exactly what he's doing, it can be quite annoying. And that speed, 300 kilometers, if you, if you crash into somebody in that speed, you know it's going to be a mess up, mega accident. And, and to me, avoiding this kind of situation going across, I couldn't have a mega accident. So Michael was pretty tough with that. So uh, fortunately, uh, I was able to then luckily overtake him because there was a slow car in front of us who was driving middle of the middle of the racetrack. So it gave me the opportunity to overtake. Do you think you would have got past him without Zonta? I, I think so. I think so. I, I think so. I, I think I would have forced the situation that way. I would have do it. Just you know, I, I think it would have happened. But the, this this definitely gave me the really good chance to do that without making a mega risk. There's that wonderful bit of footage after the race where you look like you're lecturing Michael. You, you've got your hands up like I'm doing now, sort of. I think, were you, what were you talking about? You were talking about that specific manoeuvre or were you telling him he was a naughty boy? Or It was exactly explaining that way, you know, in this bit, you know, you can't, you, you can't play the games like this because he's fighting against a double world champion he himself is a world champion. Been there, done that, raced for many years. Uh, Michael had a big accident in his career. I had a big accident in his career. So I think there has to be a certain respect. You know, we are fighting there on a racetrack. We are going to go wheel to wheel and very hard. But the really going in that speed and, and uh, pushing and doing things like that, it's, it's not acceptable. I'm not... But again, I mean, of course, me to start jumping up and down, to go to talk to team managers, going to clock at the course, making a protest to talk about that. I know it's a waste of time. It's no waste of time. He, Michael had his way of working and his style of driving, but I needed to have my word, him to understand I'm aware of what's going on. I'm not just walking away and ignoring what he's doing. I let him know that way I'm aware. But just want to say something, of course, you know, changing a tiny bit of subject. Of course, I understand what position Michael is today. Of course, it's very, very hard. And talk about the past, what we experienced, what we raised. Of course, uh, it's in a very close to my memory. There's a positive, there's negative. But both of us, I think we did an unbelievable career and great successes. So now to talk to you about Michael, about his naughty driving style sometimes, it's not so easy to talk about, of course, you know, because I don't want to talk bad about things about him which happened in the past, in the history. So I think the listeners will understand that way. I'm not talking behind his back and I do understand his position. So I hope he will get stronger in his position where he is now. Yes. I'm sure everyone listening completely agrees with you, Mika. But let's talk about Senna then. Shall we go on to another of your great rivals? Um, in fact, let's wind the clock back. So you, 1992, your last season at Lotus, there was talk of you joining Williams for 93 instead of Damon Hill. And what did Ron Dennis, the boss of McLaren, say to you or to Keke, whoever it was, to convince you to go the McLaren route and not the Williams route? This, yeah, it, it was, it wasn't, for me, it wasn't very difficult to, to make a decision. There was quite a, I was in a fantastic situation because we do, we did get a lot of offers from different companies, different teams to join because they saw my ability, my, my performance on the racetrack. They said, you know, we want this guy. So there was quite a few teams and uh, Williams was one of them. McLaren, what other teams there were? Ligier was one of them. Did Ferrari come knocking at that time? I, this was the good, that's a good one. I think they, I think that time they were, the seats were full. I think the Ferrari was only missing from there, if I remember correct. So why McLaren? Why McLaren, you ask? Uh, it was interesting. I was in Austria. I was in Keke's, Keke Rosberg's chalet over there. That time, it was, that was before Christmas, I think, uh, in 92. Keke's fax machine was running 
flat out, the paper was coming out, different different options and, and different different uh, offers. And it was a beautiful situation, you know. I was I was relaxed. I was really chill out and said, this is looking good. And of course, Keke was very stressed up. He had his glass of whiskey and, and uh, <laughs> offering for me also. I said, no, 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 it's, it's, I'm fine at the moment. And, and uh, it was a big pressure for Keke, but for me it was easier. And, and the why pressure for, well, I did not have to talk about why pressure for Keke, but, you know, this is, this is a serious decision. I think many people would think about, ah, maybe it was because of the money. And of course, that has an important part of the, of the business. But for me, I had a confidence on, on, on McLaren uh, because what I experienced in my first years in, in Formula 1, 1992, looking at the drivers who raced before with Williams, drivers who raced in 91, 92 about the talks, what was going on, how happy they were with the team Williams. And, and I did recognize that there is differences. There is differences how the team is run, how the team operates, and what are the priorities. And I, I felt that uh, the driver, the team, will get uh, full respect from the team. I mean the team. What I mean team, it means the whole people who are working at the at the team McLaren example, they all get the maximum uh, respect and the uh, driver is a star, but the driver is same time a team player. So we all win together. And I got the feeling a little bit in, in, in that time that uh, the drivers, they are the drivers for Williams. Patrick Head used to call them light bulbs, didn't he? You could take yeah, one out and put another one in. I of. think that's what it was. That got the impression I got. I said, do I have a future with something like this? And Except, I, Mika, you surely Keke, of all people, would have seen that Williams had the best car in 92. It looked as if they were going to have the best car in 93. McLaren were changing engines mm -hmm. from Honda to mm -hmm. Ford. In terms of performance... Williams looked like they were locked on for another good year, whereas there was a bit of uncertainty about McLaren, yeah. wasn't there? Yeah, absolutely. But I, I, I did say to Keke that way. I want to go to, I want to go to McLaren, and uh, I think Keke was quite surprised. I don't think he was so. He did ask me, you know, reasons why you want to do that, why you want to go there, and I did explain the exactly same thing that you know. That's what I feel, and, and I feel that in McLaren there is a, it's a very, very strong history, and the drivers are treated differently, you know, and, and, uh, and I think it's very important. The driver needs massive confidence, you know. I think the racing drivers are quite a complex people. I think they're a bit spoiled. <laughs> but, they, but they do need a great confidence push all the time, it's not question about they need to, for their ego, but they need that confidence boost because they, they need to do some extreme performance on a racetrack and they need to just go really, really incredible results. So, so I think the McLaren keeps this kind of position. How much did you want to test yourself against Senna? I, I didn't have a problem with that. I, I, to me, to, to, you know, when, when I did start working with McLaren and, and we start doing a test program and I, I was very confident to go and and to be a winner and I, I didn't have a I didn't have a I don't think I had a, any uh, fear or thinking that he, he would be quicker I did have no doubt of course I couldn't be faster than him and uh, it, it was normal I think it was just that's a way of you have to think, you know. And it's not only thinking, it's an it's a inner confidence. Because in the day we're all humans, you know, and, and uh, you know, humans make mistakes, humans can improve, you can learn. And I thought I can always be better than him. So how frustrating were those early months of 93 when Senna was in one car, but Michael Andretti 
was in another and he was having quite a scrappy start, wasn't he? He was a lot of crashing, wasn't quite as quick as it. And were you constantly pestering Ron Dennis saying, come on, put me in the car, put me in the car? Or how, how did it work? It, it was frustrating, no doubt about it. And, and of course, it, when, when the reality came, the truth came that way, i become a test driver. It was a big shock. It was a really big shock. And, and uh, it was not in my agenda. I was really confident that uh, I will go to racing and, and the team will trust my abilities and, and uh, the team knows how quick I am. So I don't have a problem with that. And, and of course, when it went, when the Arton decided to come back, it was a shock. So you signed for McLaren thinking it was going to be you and Andretti? I signed uh, that there's a possibility to Arton decide to come back. I, I fully understand that. I had a fully understanding that way. If the Arton decide to come back, I'm going to be a test driver. So I knew that. But I took that risk that there's no way he's going to come back. You know, there's no way. Because he was, the words, what he was saying, what I saw that I said, no way. He's, he's too angry for the team. He's not, how you can manage to work with the team the way you behave towards them. You know, you cannot build the relationship with them again, suddenly to say everything's fantastic. Because it's not just the one person in charge in a, in a racing team. There's a many, many in, individuals who are making decisions and, so I, I thought he's, he's no, no way going to come back. And he did. God damn it. <laughs> yeah. Can you remember the first test day you did with him? Oh, yeah. Oh, very well. And the impression did. he made on you and sitting next to him in the debrief talking about the car. Oh, yeah. I remember many of the test sessions, what we did in, in I think we were in Pembury. We were in uh, Silverstone. And uh, yeah, I, I, it, it was quite interesting. Uh, it's a, I don't think he was very keen to come for testing, first of all. He was not very interested. Yeah, he was not very prepared. It was quite, in my opinion, quite dis well, not disappointing, but I understood that way, you know, if you want team to win and the car to be fast, you have to work hard. You cannot just come there like uh, things are silver plate and just go for it. Okay, he was three times world champion. You know, so he's done his work. He has done his work. So, of course, I was quite naive in that side and looking at, come on, he should be working here every day to make the car quick and not flying back to Brazil. But the looking at his work at the test, yeah. He jumped in a car, which is set up nicely, has a nice design, and guys has done a hell of work back in the factory. So he came and did the testing, and, and that's it. Were you in awe of him in any way? Was he the sort of guy when you were coming up through the junior formulas that you looked up to? Was, if you had a, a racing driver on your wall, on your bedroom wall as a kid, was it Senna kind of, you know, was it quite surreal in a way? No, not, not really. No, not really. No, I, I, it's really weird. I think it's my personality, but I, I don't think, I think there's a, I judge the people in their personalities and how they behave, how they talk, how they respect the other people. I don't think, I don't look to people how great they are on a racetrack and what results they do. So, of course, I think great, you've done a f great races, but that doesn't make the human being to be a better person. So I justify people and I, 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 I respect the people, not because the results, but who they are. So I didn't, I didn't have too much, uh, uh, when I was younger age, looking at the Arton, he's the, he's the guy who is the, the guy who I want to be when I get in, in Formula One or to getting higher formulas. We'll be back with Mika after this short message. There's so much that happens during an F1 race that the eye can't see, even when you're down at the track. Good news then, that Amazon Web Services are on hand to bring you closer to the action. F1 uses machine learning and predictive modeling built on AWS to create critical race performance statistics, make race predictions, and give fans insight into the split-second decisions made by teams and drivers, and is able to share these insights over television and digital platforms all over the world. Some of the most exciting racing action comes from driver battles, when a chasing driver gets close enough to attempt an overtake. 
and the AWS Battle Forecast analyzes track history and projected driver pace to provide an insight into developing driver battles during the race, which might not be so obvious to the eye. Pit Strategy Battle provides real-time insight on the position of the two rival drivers, the predicted gap after their pit stops and percentage chance of an overtake, while tyre performance gives an indication of tyre wear on a performance scale, highlighting the relative degradation between two cars in a battle. And it's all powered by AWS's incredible machine learning and data analytics. So next time you're watching F1 and wondering how they get all those awesome insights, just remember... AWS is how. Find out more at aws.com slash F1 Insights. That's aws.com forward slash F1 Insights. Right, let's get back to the chat. So fast forward to Estoril, Portuguese Grand Prix. You've got the nod. You're in the car instead of Andretti. How confident were you going into that race weekend? Okay, it, it was not, uh, it was not, it was quite an interesting one, you know, to be a test driver whole year, so come back to racing, you know, it's it's a quite a, it's not going to be an easy one. And to become racing driver for McLaren, you will get a lot of media attention. Uh, your agenda during a weekend is, is busier than ever. I mean, it was busy with the Lotus, but McLaren it was even busier. Your words, what you were using, were definitely more carefully analyzed is it media is it with the team when you're on race weekend and uh, of course in a race weekend we had different engineers what we had in a test team because that time mclaren had a separate test team well the test team and the race team so there were separate people it's like two teams one was testing one was racing so going to portugal for the first grand prix i had a different mechanics I had a different engineer. So it was quite a few different new people, new elements, what I had to face. And uh, so what I tried to do, I purposely disconnected myself in terms of not thinking about it. Oh, I have new people here. So I have to start introducing myself, having a little chat, who you are, what I do, and this and that. It was no time for that. So I had to go straight to business and I focus only on going to Portugal, the kick out on Sass to go quicker than him. So that was my goal. I knew the car was not quick enough to beat Williams because they were faster. Uh, but I thought, that's it. I, that's the only thing what I had to do is to go faster than him. And you did. And it happened. <laughs> and it happened. How good it, was your lap? It was good. Uh, yeah, it, it was a very, it was very good lap. Uh, I don't think I could have gone any quicker than that. I mean, technically the car was working fine. And uh, it was a fantastic lap. Uh, so, so uh, I thought that it's no, it, it again, it's not possible to Arton can go quicker than that. And I, I felt also Arton was not. Also, I think psychologically he was not hundred uh, percent there because I think his expectations for the start of the seasons were high. That's why he decided to go to McLaren in '93. So then he realized during a year that Williams is quicker, they're doing a better job. I think he started losing his, not motivation, but, but not there. So when I'm jumping on behind the steering and going quicker, I think he woke up and said, oh my God, you know, this is not good. This is not good for me. Mm -hmm. What did he say to you? Well, he was, he was not, he, he was not shocked. He was not disappointed. Was he generous in terms of his congratulations? Well, he was just simply asking, what, what did you do? How, how did you do that? And he was serious about it. And, and uh, well, I could have started explaining to him about this. I was using this kind of technique for the driving and this and that, but I didn't want to go into that. I just said, you know, something, something which was nothing to do with the racing. So I think it upset him really big way. You know, I think it upset it because he thought, he thought, what is this guy all about? Why well, does not tell me? And I think he took me wrong way straight away that way I don't tell him the truth, how I'm performing out there. And that was not my intention, of course. It was just lighting it up, you know. This is, you know. But the guy who is three times world champion, 
and the young guys come in there, kick his ass in a qualification. Of course, for him, it was not the time to joke. It was him time to start working. And for me, it was just, you know, that's, you know, this is, this is, this is normal for me. So it was not, he was, he was not very happy about it. So it was, it was really difficult. And I, and I, I saw also impression of the team. You know, when the Aston wasn't there and I was looking at the team members, the mechanics, the engineers, they had a little smile in their face and they were really happy because, like I said earlier, you know, the team works so hard. They work so hard. You know, at that time, there was no regulation that way. The mechanics had to stop working a certain time. They can start certain time working. That time was 24-7. So they were working harder than ever. And, you know, if there's a driver who complains nonstop, doesn't do testing. So I think they were pretty happy to mechanics see like, okay, now you got the lesson here. You know, you don't get anything free. <laughs> <laughs> do you think that was the moment that you really arrived in Formula One as a driver? It certainly made a Formula One people to realize like, yeah, this guy is quick. He has a talent. And, and he, can, he can do great things, you know. Do you think, had Ayrton already committed to Williams at that point for the following year? I don't know in real, but uh, normally, you know, th- th- you, Around start, that time, you start discussions yeah. and, and the planning for the future. Because you talk about the smiles on the faces of the management and the engineers mm. and Ron Dennis in particular. There must have been a sense of relief that we've got a guy who can replace Ayrton Senna right here in our car. There must have been that feeling as well. Yes, uh, absolutely, absolutely. And, 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 uh, you know, because team had a very good data and record of my testing, what I have done in in that that year. They knew how quick I am and that they knew how committed I am for the team. And and, and they, they, they knew we can do good things together. But I think, of course, this kind of, Racing Estoril in in '93 confirms to the whole team, everybody back in the factory, everybody that wow, we we have a good driver in the team now, and and the Ron has made a good decision to take me to the team. Can you talk a little bit about Ron and what he did for your career? Well, well for me, basically, you know, I, I think he gave. Uh, well, he he knew what he was doing. He did employ somebody he did employ a good racing driver uh i think he you know he knew that way i'm a loyal uh, person and uh, i'm talent and and i have a room to develop i'm ready to learn <laughs> and same time quite a neutral uh you know coming from finland and and i think it was important for for ron also that uh uh, that, you know, uh, he did not uh, to have a guy who was a superstar, just a normal guy. And I think that worked fantastically for the team to, to with the mechanics and with the engineers. And uh, I think that was the one of the good things. And and, uh, and for Ron, for Ron, of course, uh, I think Ron gave me a lot of time to learn from mistakes. If you If you have a team and you want the team to be successful in Formula One, you know, you need to make a, you have to make a really many years planning ahead. Is it one year or is it two or five or 10 years? I mean, if I would go to Formula One now to make a team, I would say minimum 10 years, you know, I would make a plan that way one day it's going to work out. Is it going to be a one world championship, but it's going to work out, but it's going to take 10 years and it's going to be bloody expensive. <laughs> uh, but, but, but that's and and the, and the, and the, and the Ron gave a good chance for me to develop, continue to be fast, and uh, to have a vision that the machine has to be right. You know, the engine has to be right, the chassis has to be right, the people has to be right, and then we can win. Changing the driver for non-stop for the team, you're just messing up everything, because the driver is one of the key elements who brings the stability in the team. It's like anything in the in Formula One, if you keep changing engine, keep changing chassis, the designers, the mechanics, you never found the harmony 
to get a, and and you never get the success. So, so to get everything best, you know, it requires a lot of time, a lot of planning, and a lot of money. Did you ever lose faith in McLaren? Because it took you what was it, ninety six races to win a Grand Prix. That first race at Estoril we've discussed was a Ford engine. You then go to Peugeot the next year. Then it's Mercedes the year after that. So there's a lot of change. Did you ever question what was going on in a negative way? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, it was a lot of discussion to me to, to understand why this person with Ron. Why, why this person? Why, why God damn it, employing somebody like that? You know, they think they know what they do, but they don't know nothing, you know. And... Uh, it's it's fascinating to to see it uh, the whole concept why things are happening and taking Ron to walk and said look at those look at those you know how they work and what they have and and to to, to be in a team managers or the owner or team managers position is such a hard position uh, because you really have to see such a wide picture when happening something and what's happening something. And when you are when you are communicating with racing drivers, they want everything straight away, you know. But it's not sometimes it's not possible. You have to wait one or two years. So I had moments in my career with McLaren thinking about, oh my God, what we are doing. This 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 is not good. So only thing what you can tell yourself that way, patience, you know, believe the team and and look back down in a history what they have done. It will come. It, the re- history will repeat itself. It's going to take some time and just keep working. When did you feel it was starting to come together? Was it the start of 97 or do we talk about 96? It, it certainly came together when we, when, we had a, yeah, when we had a Mercedes engine. That was an important element for the team, my opinion. And it was a long-term agreement, so... Consistency came there, confidence then came, no any doubts in the air. So we had a we had a confidence that you know it's a long term, and Mercedes has a certain reputation, and they want to spend money, they want to win. So everybody wants to win, so then there's a success. But if there's just like we want to be in Formula One, it's not good enough. So that was that was the important part. We got a new partner, Resma, to be our main sponsor. Ah, so- that was one of the highlights. You with the Spice Girls, I remember it. Yeah, yeah. That was <laughs> a- I remember the launch. I was that there. was so funny. That was so <laughs> funny. That was so much fun. Uh, that, that was a good one. So Rams, yeah. that was important to have a new color for the team, to start the new new era for the partnership with, uh, with the marketing side. Uh, that was 97, wasn't it? So mm-hmm. it's was almost as if, and then you won your first race and then yeah. championships come and yeah. Okay. And of course, the important element was David. Uh, David Coulthard, which was a very fast driver, and uh, believing himself so much that he is the best in the world, you know. And and uh, it was great to be his teammate because he woke me up, you know, to fight even harder. And and I had challenges to fight against him because it was just after my accident, because '95 had a really big accident, and and David David came to my teammate. If I remember '96. You know, so 95 had an accident and four months later we had, a, or five months later, we are in the first Grand Prix. And the five months before that Grand Prix, I had a cracked skull in a, in a hospital in a coma. So then having a teammate who was a young guy, ready for winning, star of the Formula One, raced already with Williams. So it was really difficult to have driver next to me who had a quality like he had to beat him it was really, really difficult. So all those Mercedes, the new partner, then uh, David Coulthard. So that was the time when I start seeing that when now we are not right, now we start moving right directions. You say that David was the perfect teammate, but I mean, I remember- Did I say perfect? Well, I don't know, that was probably I my word. Good, no, good, good. Yeah. <laughs> oh my Sorry, God. sorry, sorry, you didn't say perfect. <laughs> but but all I, I've just got this image in my head, sorry, and it's slightly <laughs> skewing my thoughts, which is, was it Austria 99 when the championships at a crucial point and David crashed into you at turn two, I seem to remember? That is correct, yeah. Yeah, that is, that is correct. So- it wasn't always 
easy. No, 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 no. Him. There was definitely no. There was no always a good. We we didn't have very good start with David and me, in my opinion. Yeah, David, very difficult start. Why? I okay. We talk about '95, and then comes the season '96. So I'm racing with the McLaren already for '93, '94, '95, and fourth year coming with McLaren, and then comes this young guy and you know Scottish guy and coming there that way I can. I'm the number one. So it's like a it was a difficult situation, and of course coming from that accident made a, made a situation very difficult to. To really to go for it, to really to go to full, full, full speed, and and to do performance. So, so that was quite a difficult with David. David was quite a, and I I saw in David very first time when I see him, he, he was, he he had it very difficult to trust me, and I I felt very uncomfortable. You know, when you have somebody who doesn't trust you, it's a quite an unpleasant feeling. Why do you think he didn't trust you? I don't know. I never asked him. <laughs> Even today, I never asked him. Do you think but, uh, same, same reason. Be, you said be, Ayrton was a little. It could be. It could be my my uh, thinking. But it, it it was quite a challenge to me to see because to make the team forward, we had to work together. We had to trust each other. And and uh, it, it could be also to be honest, maybe language issue. What what was uh, making attention there? You know. Maybe I didn't understand so well the Scottish jokes, and he didn't understand the Finnish jokes. <laughs> so there was something which didn't work out well. But but we had incidents uh, like in ninety was it already ninety six or ninety seven? We had an accident in Estoril in a race, and we were racing position eight or nine or something, with, you know, not even on the points. And then accident in in Austria. So it was a difficult, Austria was a very difficult one uh, afterwards, after the race, to see what, what we, how we can solve this. I mean, inside, in, internally in a team, we, one way or other we can solve this, but nobody don't give the points back. You know, we can't, this, what is gone is gone. And what is gone is gone because the, somebody's mistake. And, and this time it was David who did the mistake. And and we are positioned to win first and second. So what is the purpose of this kind of mistake? So it was very hard to understand that uh, why. But again, you cannot change that. What has happened has happened. It was difficult at the race that where are you going to go crazy in front of everybody and screaming about how silly teammate you have or or is it David to find all the possible excuses why this happened and and the team is inside maybe start thinking about now these two our fantastic drivers start fighting each other and so i think it was a uh, uh, ron dennis and, and norbert haug were able to found solution and calming us down and and founding a harmony again and and uh, just to just to not forgetting it but just to think about again the future that way let's not it's not. It's not going to change anything. But let's not make sure it's not going to happen second time. And I don't think it did. No, it did no. not. No. <laughs> after after no. the Austria. No. We'll head into the final part of our chat with Mika in just a moment. But first, we've got a special offer that might just whet your appetite. Hello Fresh can help take away the stress and time needed to cook meals from scratch, and you don't have to compromise on taste. They are the UK's leading recipe box service and they deliver fresh pre-portioned ingredients and step-by-step recipes to your door so you can turn those delicious ingredients into delicious dinners with ease. And they deliver six days a week. It's especially useful if you find yourself rolling out the same fail-safe dish on a regular basis and want to try something new to liven up your weekday meals. After all, you can only trot out the same meal a certain number of times before the wife and kids start asking questions, or worse still, your 12-year-old daughter asks you to step away from the cooker. You can choose from 19 HelloFresh recipes every week, including rapid recipes, which you can whip up in 20 minutes or less, family favourites, British and world cuisine, and even lower calorie balanced meals. 
Their ingredients come directly from their suppliers and are pre-portioned so there's no food waste. Subscriptions are flexible with no fixed term, so if for any reason you need to change your usual delivery, skip weeks or alter the box size to suit you or your family's needs, you can. HelloFresh are offering our listeners £60 off four boxes. All you have to do is visit www.hellofresh.co.uk and enter the code GRID at the checkout. Visit hellofresh.co.uk and enter the code GRID at the checkout so you too can enjoy dinner without the drama. Right, let's get back to the final part of our chat with Mika. Mika, you've made a couple of references to Adelaide 95, your crash. What can you remember from the accident itself? Well, it, it of, of course, it is a long time ago already, but I, I, do, I do remember that day and the performances, what we did. I do remember the accident uh, itself, but... Uh, the memory what I have is that definitely when I was sitting in a car and not not able to move, and I I realized I, I realized that shit I cannot move my legs and I cannot I cannot get out of the car and I thought that's it. I I felt that I'm in a, that's it. I'm in the shit. Uh, then I just see next thing I see the guy come in front of me and and uh, and and uh, I, I I said to myself just now just just relax just don't do nothing because it's nothing what I can do. So then they just put the, I don't know what to call it. Uh, is it the tracheotomy, was it? Then? Yeah, mm. so and they, they put me... So just, you were conscious, is that what you're saying? I was I was a little wild. I was a little wild until, of course, when they put the hole in your... But initially you were, so... So you remember that it was a left rear... Yeah, infl- inf- puncture, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Mm. So, so, of course, then there's a things... You know, when you're waking up from the hospital, remember the situation and, and uh, what happened in the hospital. It was, it was really, really horrible things. Uh, it's like in a horror movie, I, I tell you. It, everything just is grey and dark. So that's what was that all about at all time. Even even you, I had a good people around me, you know, it still, it is such a horrible, grey, dark time in my life. I think when when you do survive from that, you, you you come out of the hospital, you can start walking on the street, you do thank the people who were supporting you and taking care of you that horrible time. But even then, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a horrible experience. How long did it take you to get over it? I don't think... Do you ever get over something like no, that? No, I don't think, I, you don't ever get over it. Uh, in, in racing life, you know, you have to, and I, I wanted to go back to racing after time. So, so you, you ignore it. You don't, you stop thinking about it. You just have to go for your, your, your racing performance. But the, you, you never, you, you never get over it. You know, you can talk to any, to anybody in this world and uh, try to get over it and, but you cannot, you cannot escape what that, what you've gone through. You have to live with it. You have to, to work harder to be healthy and better person to cope this kind of shit. What you've gone through, you know. Otherwise, you just you go deeper. You know, you 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 start feeling pity for yourself, and and I don't think that's going to take you far in your life. So it is a big challenge to to go through that. But like I said, there was a great great people to to help you and and uh, yeah. Did you ever question whether you wanted to continue as a racing driver? Oh, definitely. I mean, definitely. It, it in the first place, it was not even didn't come to my mind because it was not physically even not possible to do anything in life. You know, are you able to live normal life? You know, you never knew that. Then when you start getting a bit stronger, uh, it was a moment when uh, came the discussion that way, hopefully soon I can fly back to Europe from Australia and to go to hospital in Europe. But first, before I can even fly, they had to put me in this pressurizing tank. I don't know what to call it in English, the kind of same pressure what you have in airplanes or in a submarines, you know. I have to go to Navy, they put me in this tank. Just to see how the pressure would affect you exactly you know so so how how long were you in adelaide after the accident 
if I would say nearly two months, something like that. Right, okay. So, so that includes Christmas then, I suppose. Were you there Christmas? I think after Christmas, I think. I, uh, before yeah. Christmas, I think I got it. Something like that. It is, you must, did you come back with an Australian accent? You were there for so long. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. But the, it was, a, but hey, really, I mean, yeah, yeah. I had a really fantastic uh, to, to health care in, in there, what, what they gave me. But then I came back to England. I was there in the hospital, in Sid Watkins Hospital in, in London also. Uh, really difficult time. But, but the, thinking about, Racing, driving, driving, racing. I've been lost, lost. I was, I was already 68 kilos when I was racing. So I lost a lot of weight. So I was such a skeleton, so skinny. And doctors, you know, when, when I was not able to walk and, you know, they, they even didn't allow me to go do any exercise. So I thought, well, if I, you know, of course, if you want to go back to sport, racing, you know, you cannot do any exercise. How are you going to manage to do that? So it was very difficult. Uh, coming back to Monaco then finally from England and to be at home in Monaco, I was, I was sitting in the terrace and I was thinking the time will come when I will get the phone call that way if I want to continue. It's a horrible feeling. I mean, great feeling because the team, the management, nobody didn't pressurize me. Mika, give you answer today. No, they gave me time to last minute to make my decision. You know, so it was it was a horrible time. So it was a gradual process, the return. It wasn't, you didn't like wake up one morning and no. go. I was getting stronger in, I would say, end of the 97, when I was starting getting physically back to really shape. You're talking until the end of 97? Yeah. Yes. Two years? Yeah, so it took a long Gosh. time. How ner how nervous were you before testing for the first time after the accident? It was at Paul Ricard, wasn't it? It was at Paul Ricard, but I, I knew the track is easy. I knew, knew the track is easy to drive. And so I was, when I went there, I, I know I'm going to go flat out. I didn't have no fear. I, I didn't have no doubt if, I didn't think about if I lost my driving performance or or talent or something, I didn't, no, I, I knew I was gonna go flat out. It was more about uh, fear that, that what the mechanic's gonna say, because I, I did look like a, you know, Adam's family, you know, a little bit like a monster, you know, you know, the <laughs> you know, because they shaved the hair from the, <laughs> I mean, Adam's family, it's a movie, isn't it? Something like that, you know. So they had, you know, to shave the hair from other side and, uh, of course, the other side of the face because it was paralyzed. So it didn't work properly. So I, I didn't look too normal. So going to the test, I was wondering what the mechanics going to see. They have seen me for all my, you know, gradually my career, 93, 94. And then, so I wonder what they're going to say when they're going to see me. Because it was a serious moment. Imagine, you know, the, you know Christmas is getting, you know, to, no, this was in, it was in January, I think, yeah. So, you know, the mechanics are thinking, what, what, what's going to happen? You know, I was worried about when they're going to see me, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to get shocked. I mean, of course, they had, a, they had a great sense of humor. You know, of course they have. They're good lads, they're good guys. And, but I, when, I, when I did arrive to Paddock and I walk in the car, I was like, shit, you know, I should be, you know. Normally I come there with full confidence, full power, full energy. Smile on my face, okay, guys. Let's let's work hard. Let's gonna do well, and let's find solution for the problems. But now this was the this was the case when I have to come to Karas and and I, I do I don't look so good. I don't look so well. So the mechanics they they cannot just start screaming. Yeah, great, you are back, fantastic. No, 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 no. They saw that way. This guy has gone through to hell. What did they say? Well. Many of them were happy I'm back, I'm okay. Uh, but you know, the visual look was already uh, something that way. It was a bit, a bit not so what they used to it. You know, because I'm so careful with my hair always and everything. And so the other side is shaved oh, off. those film star looks make it. Yeah, yeah, so it was a bit difficult. Yeah. But they were okay. And, and when I did jump in a car, I, I was very confident, you know, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. And did it all come back immediately? Absolutely. It was like away. you hadn't been away. Absolutely. 
I mean, I did so much driving with McLaren, the, the racing and testing that it was just, I knew the car, I mean, everything. Did yeah. your attitude to safety change after that? <sighs> not so much, surprisingly, not so much. Don't ask me why. Uh, I was focusing the team and yeah, uh, not so much. I didn't start going to FIA and say you have to change everything now. Not change everything now, but change that, change that corner and, you know, you know I, I think... Uh, Equally, when Senna and Ratzenberger were killed, how did that affect you? Well, it's, of course, it's, you know, it... it, uh, it what do you mean, how did it affect how me? Did it just the impact of their... Was it a wake-up call for you as a racing driver? Because there'd been what twelve years prior to that, there hadn't been. No, a I mean I knew the motor. I knew that way in the motor racing and before me, before you know, you know there has been accident. Motor racing is dangerous, so every driver who goes into sport knows there is a risk. There is no way somebody's crying afterwards that you know something happened. Oh my God! Hey, come on, guys! You know if you. If you go to this port and you go 200 miles per hour, you know, you crash on the wall, there's a very big chance you're going to die. So if that happens, it's no point to... <laughs> this sounds horrible what I'm telling, but it's a fact. It's a choice what we do for the life. We can do other things than if we don't... We have to recognize the reality. Uh, but yeah, when the great champion Arton Rotzenberger dies like that, it is a shock. In the same weekend, you know, same, of course, same racetrack. So it is a shock. It's terrifying. But it's like when I had my accident in 95. So I come back to, you know, back to Europe and go to FI I said, you know, hey, you know, really, are you really designing this kind of racetracks and racing cars that way I get hurt? They're going to look at me and say, what are you talking about? When you do sign your super license, you know the risks. You, when you sign the contract with the teams, tire manufacturers, you sign your name, you know exactly what are the risks. So there's no point afterwards going there to complaining that something happens. Do you know your risks? So it's, it's a horrible thing, but that's the, that's the reality. Luckily, the things are better today and, and the teams are more aware to FIA working very hard for the safety. The companies who are involved in, in Formula One, in motor racing, even it's dangerous, you know, we cannot lose any lives. You know, nobody don't want to be a partner of Formula One if FIA or the drivers and teams don't care about the safety. So something has to be done and, and so many good things has been happening with the safety. But there is always, always something can happen because we are in vault with the high speed machine formula one so Mika, when you look back at it all when do you think you were at your peak what was your best season from a driving point of view yeah that's a good one i i think <clears throat> I, I feel like uh, 95 the year when i had my accident i started getting very strong getting very strong physically very strong mentally starting really to understand the philosophy of, of what's happening here getting very strong position in the team. It was a good thing the accident happened that time because I was so strong. But yeah, I then, then I would say uh, when we come into year, for sure, 97, 98, you know, psychological development, able to focus, concentrate, able to handle the pressure, communicate with a lot of people, you know, all that elements develop in a very good way. So we're talking about, it has to be, say, 98, 99, 2000. 98, you won eight races, didn't you? So, yeah. Certainly a lot of champagne spraying. Yeah, I think, yeah, it, it could have been better, but it was enough. <laughs> it, was, it was definitely enough. <laughs> yeah. What about, I mean, Mika, what about a best race? You won 20 races. I mean, is there one that stands out? more than any other? I, I think, that, that, that again, I think uh, that for sure, Monaco is always, uh, you know, the greatest, greatest victory what I ever done in my career. Well, it was 
unbelievable uh, victory, beautiful success, and, and uh, that that comes to number one from all of us. But there is Silverstone. There was a Canadian Grand Prix. There's a USA Grand Prix. Your so, last one, Jimmy. Yeah, the last one at Indy. Yeah. 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 So there were so many good Grand Prix, uh, which which were important. But Monaco is a, it's a mega. It was a mega victory, you know. You were completely made up. I do remember that. Yeah. It so was, happy. Yes, it was really important in in that year. I think I. When I look back now, if I would not win the Monaco Grand Prix, I don't think I could have won the World Championship. I really needed that. It was a psychological boost for me and for the team. What goes on, by the way, after you win Monaco Grand Prix? You're going to have dinner with the Prince Albert, is that right? Uh, it, it was a it was it, it was a gala dinner, of course, with His Highness in sporting uh, uh, black tie dinner. Absolutely, absolutely fantastic, brilliant fun, good fun indeed. Then there was. Uh, one day break and next day testing in Monza. <laughs> it was pretty tough, I That's tell you. Full on, isn't that it? was really tough, I tell you. Straight away. How Monza. long would it take you to get over a Monaco Grand Prix? Because of the intensity of well, on track and off track, really, isn't it? In in real world, I should have like a four days time to recover. You know, to to do to exercise and and to have a good sleep, uh, good normal nutrition. I think I wouldn't need. Four days. So and I it, think one extra day because the celebration. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so is it fair to say you weren't at your best at testing on the Tuesday after your winning? No, book? <laughs> I had to admit, definitely not. No, at, you, at you the, retired at the uh, end of 2001. Do you think you retired at the right time? I felt it was the right time. It, it was a sabbatical, actually. That's how you announced it. Was, it. was it always going to be a retirement? Yeah, but, but that, that was the right thing because, uh, because this was a psychological decision. Uh, so you never know how the people's mind is working and how it can change when you are in certain pressure and situation. You your your mind can change. So it was a good option to to run to that way. We keep the door open. That way, if you want to come back, we are here. Uh, was it pretty clear quite quickly that you weren't going to come back? Or? It was. It was quite clear after all. That way, this is it. This I is do better. remember. Tell me if I'm wrong, but I do remember you being linked with, was it Williams for a bit? Even BAR I, maybe? Yeah, I had a, I had quite a few later, four years later, I think, three, four years later, there was a idea to come back. I got the phone call. Uh, was it Frank calling me? That way, if I'm interested to come back. And, I, and automatically I got to, to start thinking, hmm, this could be interesting. Well, it just didn't work out. It was too many, uh, too many things which just didn't match. It didn't match. It, 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 it wasn't a good idea. And I'm, and luckily I did were listening older drivers, some older drivers listening about their impression without without them knowing that time anything. So it was definitely the right decision. I didn't go back. It would be a big mistake. And then since retirement, Mika, you've um, there's been a bit of DTM and things, but off track. Can you just explain to us your, is it professional relationship with Bottas? Do you, are you do you manage him? Because I'm part of the I'm part of the team for Walter's uh, uh, management team. Uh, yeah, we have a number of people taking care of him uh, from the start of his career. I mean, of course, of course, Walter had great supporters in his very early career in his karting and low formulas making a great financial effort, psychological effort to helping him. But but I, I came to picture, was it all right, five, six years ago? Quite a few, quite a few years, yeah, about six years ago. Uh, and, and it was fascinating to see Walter's character, his performance on the racetrack and his development become a professional racing driver. And he's done a fantastic work, really great job. Do you think he's got the most difficult job in Formula One, being alongside Lewis Hamilton? Well, I think he has a, you know, be a racing driver. I think it's the easiest job to have. <laughs> I know. It's a, it's a, such a, it's, it's a Formula One, you know, to, I think it's a great to be a racing driver. I, I never would change that to anything else. 
We've been discussing a lot about, you know, I, I had a chance to have a teammate for Nigel Mansell or Arton Senna, many great drivers and, and all of these drivers have different qualities and different challenges. And, and Valtteri, Valtteri has, has Lewis. And I understand 100% his pressure, his challenges, what he's going through. And uh, people are people. I don't think people has changed. Uh, of course, the way the people think these days is a bit different in younger generations what it is my time. But the goal, when you're on a racetrack, the goal is the same. And the way of working with the people is the same. And, and uh, it's all about learning. Learning about yourself. Able to find the motivation, uh, discipline to get the success. And absolutely when you are against uh, Louis with as one world champions many times, he has he has a lot of information, a lot of uh, experience, what he has gathered all the years. So so Walter is in a fascinating position uh, to able to be even better racing try what he is today. And then he's doing a great, great job, my opinion. He will get the great success. As part of his management team, how frustrating is it that he keeps just getting one year, one year, one year? Well, uh, if it, you're listening, Toto. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, I, I, I am, you know, it's, it's to, like to anybody, you know, when you are in a, in a business world, you want to see the success uh, from the people. And uh, if you are confident with your people who you're working with, that way they can manage to do the great job. Uh, I think it's a, I think it's a very important way to show the company that way we're going to do well. And uh, like, like I said the earlier, what I was discussing here, do I look drivers out there that way their results? I look about their personalities, how they behave towards the team, how they motivate the team. And, and I think there's a, such a big many elements with, which are influencing the decision of the team to have driver one year or two years or ten years. But uh, I, I think when, when you do have a great driver like Valtteri, it's, it's obvious that Walter is one of the greatest racing drivers out there in ever in his attitude and his behavior. And I think he's a great ambassador for Formula One, uh, also for Mercedes. He will definitely go for great result next year. And I think the team will, they will realize something very special next year. Oh, how exciting. Well, look, final question is how mad is it that Kimi Raikkonen, a driver you raced against, is still racing? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, his longevity is extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, to Kimi to be so long time in Formula One, it, it, it definitely a very impressive. And uh, I, have, I have hardly anything to say. I mean, physically, I think, yes, it is possible, but, oh, but psychologically able to handle all the pressure. It's not easy. It's, it's a different life. It's a different lifestyle. Being a Formula One better, it's, it's, it's a very, very different than outside of the Formula One better. So to able to psychologically go through that criticism, uh, fighting against the problems nonstop, it is a, it's not the easy one. Especially when you are world champion, especially when you have tasted the victories, you know what it's like. And not able to do that. It's not psychologically very easy. So I'm very impressed with him and uh, uh, high respect that way he can do it so long. It is very impressive. Well, Mika, what a joy to speak to you. Thank you so much for your time. It's, it's been wonderful. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for listening. Cheers. Well, how about that? Mika had the hairs on the back of my neck standing up at various points during that chat, particularly when talking about the aftermath of his accident in Adelaide. I loved his thoughts on Schumacher, on Senna, on winning Monaco, on pretty much everything really. 
Thank you, Mika, for your time. It was a fascinating conversation and one that I loved from start to finish. And thanks too to Sammy and Celine for their help and hospitality. Well, that's it for this episode, but we'll be back next week with yet another big name from the world of Formula One. Until then, why not subscribe to Beyond the Grid if you haven't already? We're on all of your favorite podcast apps, including Apple and Spotify. And thanks too for your feedback about last week's episode with Franz Tost. I thought you guys would be surprised by him and very much in a positive way. Patrick got in touch via Twitter to say this. Thank you, thank you for having Franz Tost on Beyond the Grid this week. I've been wanting to get to know more about Franz and this did not disappoint. Such an intelligent team principal and an even better human being. Thanks again. Well, I certainly found Franz's honesty and openness refreshing and his passion for the sport is infectious, isn't it? And please keep your feedback coming, guys, because we love it. Remember to use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid and you can tweet me at Tom Clarkson F1. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audioboom. Until next time, keep it flat out. <laughs>